We're joined by Emily Jashinsky, culture editor at The Federalist, who is in Washington, D.C. Emily, thank you for joining us. This is Joe Biden's first visit to the border in more than a year. Why is he going now? Yeah, he's going now, I think, especially because polling has found there was a Gallup poll actually just released this week that found immigration is now what Americans say is the biggest problem facing the country. Uh, so, you know, when you're asked to rank which issues are the biggest problems facing the country by Gallup, uh, people actually are now putting economy, put, putting immigration above the economy, putting immigration above uh, every other issue, 28 percent of the country right now says it's the most important issue. And why do they think that? Well, because the numbers that we've seen over the course of the Biden administration have become very, very hard for President Biden himself to ignore. And it's become more high profile as uh, leaders in the House and the Senate have been negotiating over Ukraine funding, Israel funding, uh, because House Republicans and Senate conservatives insist on uh, funding for the border and actually on a bill that would uh, dramatically change the way that border security in the United States works, uh, the media has been talking nonstop about immigration. So uh, it's just, you know, Joe Biden has seen high numbers throughout his presidency. They aren't at their very peak right now. Uh, that was, you know, late last year. They were just hitting records, it seemed like, every single day. Uh, but because it's become a political football, it sort of forced the media to cover the issue in a way that Joe Biden now feels like he really has to deal with. Mm, what will this do for his chances at re-election? Do you think Americans will see through that it is an election year or will it, you know, boost his support? No, I don't think there's any way that Joe Biden can wiggle out of the crisis that's happened, even just politically, over the course of uh, this last couple of years during his time. Uh, I don't think, you know, because it's already happened, I think that's probably one of the biggest parts here. It doesn't matter necessarily what happens from now until November. Obviously, it helps him if the border numbers go down from now until November when the presidential election happens. But no matter what, Donald Trump has, and, and immigration, by the way, is one of Donald Trump's signature issues. It's one of the reasons that he first uh, catapulted to uh, success in the Republican primary all the way back in 2015, because he was talking about immigration from a hardline conservative perspective. And even Republicans at the time were afraid to talk about it that way. We actually saw a similar dynamic play out all these years later, just when Senate Republicans were debating legislation over the last couple of weeks. So this is Donald Trump's strongest issue. And Joe Biden, just by the way that he's governed, uh, we're north of 5 million people that have come into the country, migrants that have given have been given entrance into the country and are currently still in this country. Some numbers have that closer to 10 million. Uh, those numbers are crazy for Joe Biden to defend, and they've already happened. So he can you know, try to, it, it definitely helps him to try to sort of stanch the flow over the next several months, but he can't undo uh, what happened over the course of his time. And another, just really quickly, another story that highlights that is the young girl who was killed in Georgia. Uh, this has been getting a lot of media coverage by a migrant who was here illegally, should have been deported for criminal violations, uh, came into the country in recent years. It, every time that happens uh, going forward, that's going to be, this is this is part of the problem that Joe Biden has and that there have already been millions of people uh, with dubious asylum claims let into the country um, as migrants under his time in office. So every time, you know, there's there's something like this that comes up, that's going to go right back to Joe Biden from now until November. Absolutely. And that is such a heartbreaking story. We actually have a documentary coming out later this week, really looking into that and some of the consequences that are occurring because of the crisis at the border. I guess, finally, what does it tell us or tell the world how bad the crisis is at the border that we have Joe Biden and Donald Trump visiting parts of the southern border on the same day? And what do you expect will, will come out of that visit? Yeah, I think on Thursday, they're both going to Brownsville, Texas. And Brownsville, Texas is right across the Rio Grande River from Matamoros, Mexico. And I actually went to Matamoros and to Brownsville a couple of years ago and talked to a pastor who runs a migrant shelter there who was imploring, he said in regular meetings that he would have uh, with you know, American officials, people in the Biden administration, he and other people running shelters would implore the administration to tell people just not to come. Uh, and so what we saw last year when Joe Biden went to the border was the city of El Paso, which is right across from Juarez, was totally cleaned up. And Biden didn't actually meet with a migrant. He went to a shelter, but he didn't actually meet migrants and hear their stories. So Donald Trump, who is a master, again, of this issue and of the media, 
uh, will likely have a much better, whatever it is, photo op, uh, media opportunity, what, whatever it is uh, that he does in, in Mexico will obviously, or in, in Texas, that is Brownsville, uh, will, will obviously be better for him than whatever Joe Biden either does. Because if Joe Biden actually confronts the truth of this issue, he's going to be talking to uh, migrants, people who run these shelters, who see human trafficking with every single migrant. Every migrant pays a cartel to cross uh, with very, very few exceptions. Everyone does it. So if he, if he confronts this issue honestly, he's confronting an incredible failure of his, his own policy. Uh, human trafficking on a vast scale, uh, drug smuggling on a vast scale, kidnappings, uh, sexual violence on a vast scale. And uh, I don't think that's what Joe Biden is going down there to do. So if he doesn't confront the issue honestly, then again, he has a disastrous appearance like he did last year when he went to El Paso and the streets. Suddenly, uh, they had been you know, it, filthy and uh, covered with the huddled masses, people in, in desperate situations, migrants who are uh, you know, in desperate situations, they all were cleaned up from the streets. So that's not good for Joe Biden either. I mean, it's a catch-22 of his own making. Mm. Yeah, we will have to wait and see what unfolds when he does visit the, uh, the border on Thursday. Uh, other pieces of, inf of news, I should say, that are making headlines in the US, Republican Senator Mitch McConnell has announced that he will step down as party leader in November. The Kentucky senator, who turned 82 last week, will leave as the longest serving Senate leader in history. The minority leader says that he plans to hold on to his seat in the chamber, his current term ending in 2027. One of life's most underappreciated talents is to know when it's time to move on to life's next chapter. Still have enough gas in my tank to thoroughly disappoint my critics, and I intend to do so with all the enthusiasm with which they become accustomed. Emily, what's your analysis on this? Yeah, uh, my colleague Sean Davis at The Federalist was talking to folks uh, in Senate conservative circles today and Senate insiders, and their read on the situation actually is that this is a way for Mitch McConnell to hold on to power kind of paradoxically because uh, it, it looked like he actually might have been pushed out sooner than November, or at least that his legacy was going to be severely tarnished. We saw Senator Ted Cruz and actually other sort of mainstream, popular conservative senators call for an end to Mitch McConnell's leadership over the course of just the last month, especially over that failed immigration deal that he brokered along with Senator James Langford and Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. So that was uh, sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. And all of these Republicans who had been dissatisfied with Mitch McConnell for more than a decade. I mean, Senator Marco Rubio, a popular Republican senator, today after the McConnell news came out, tweeted uh, an emoji that was sort of uh, like a, it was a silly face emoji. And that immediately conjures uh, the fact that Mitch McConnell endorsed Marco Rubio's primary opponent all the way back in 2009, Charlie Crist, who is now a Democrat. Mitch McConnell uh, uh, actually endorsed Rand Paul's primary opponent back in 2014. He has done this where he has sort of staked out a position against the hardcore conservatives. He spoke out constantly against the Tea Party uh, in the 2010s and, and really became an enemy of sort of the conservative movement in Washington, D.C., but was able to paper over those divisions uh, by getting a lot of appointments to the Supreme Court and a lot of what people saw, at least for a time, as conservative victories. And so they sort of went along with Mitch McConnell as leader because uh, he was you know, seen as uh, somebody who was a legislative master. You know, he knew parliamentary procedure. He knew how to obstruct what Democrats were doing. Uh, but that started to bubble to the surface just in the last month. So it's very possible that in the coming months, Mitch McConnell would have faced a really, really tough challenge. And now he'll have time. I mean, he, he clings to power for another election cycle and will have time to kind of hand pick a successor, especially because, again, his health is failing. He's had serious health complications just in the last year. And people who work in the Senate say he just physically looks much frailer than he used to. Mm. Uh, and that's understandable given the health complications. Another man who is looking much frailer in recent years is the president himself, Joe Biden. And this poll that has come out might come as no surprise. This poll shows that Joe Biden is facing an enthusiasm gap heading into the 2024 election. Emily, are you surprised or why, why could that be? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not surprised by that at all. 
Um, but there have been other polls that have found not only is it an enthusiasm gap, some of it is translating into gains for Donald Trump. So, for example, New York Times and Axios both had polls in the last month or so that showed Donald Trump gaining like no Republican, high profile Republican has in a long time with young voters. Uh, so it's for example, or, or black voters and Hispanic voters is what uh, some polls have found. And so it's not just that uh, Democrats are less enthusiastic about Joe Biden. It's actually that some people are starting to take a second look at Donald Trump, which is not what anybody you know here in Washington, D.C. would have predicted. But that's how bad Joe Biden is for the Democratic Party, especially, again, with young people who are very crucial to his victory in 2020, coming out in big numbers in college towns and swinging the vote for him in battleground states with some of those big college towns. Uh, it's one thing to have an enthusiasm gap that's bad, bad enough on its own, but what it looks like is also some of that is translating to Donald Trump. Um, so that's in Michigan, for example, last night, you know, some 20% of the vote was a protest vote. So uncommitted, that option got about 13% of the vote. Another five or so went to Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson. Uh, we saw that in college towns, but we also just saw that in areas that were concentrated with young people. A lot of the upset was over uh, Joe Biden's policy towards Israel. So with young voters in particular, that enthusiasm gap is real. And what's worse for Democrats is it could actually start bleeding into support for Republicans. And people are now looking at what are the best replacements for Joe Biden. You've written a piece on why Kamala Harris is not a good bet to be Joe Biden's replacement and why we should really prepare for the downfall of Kamala Harris. Can you talk us through why that is? I went and looked back at some of the polling for Kamala Harris uh, because, you know, I remember 2017, 2018, Kamala Harris was one of the politicians that had the most buzz and the most goodwill with sort of elite media and the political establishment here in Washington, D.C. And it showed in her polls. She was glamorous, women, woman of the year, I think that was back in 2018, was getting tons of positive press coverage. And in the polls, she was doing really well. She was going up and up and up. And then after she became vice president, president and the spotlight really hit her hard. Uh, she had a failed presidential candidacy in the middle of that, too. You know, everyone, again, thought, you know, Kamala Harris might be the one to beat. She would be a safe bet if you were putting money on the candidates. You wouldn't be dumb for putting most of your chips on Kamala Harris. Uh, but she didn't even make it to Iowa, uh, again, because just this sort of lackluster performance. And when the spotlight really hit her as vice president, she's had gaff after gaff after gaff. Part of that is because the Biden team has given her the worst possible tasks, you know, fixing the, quote, root causes of the border crisis, uh, yeah. not an easy thing to deal with at all. Uh, so she hasn't been helped by that, but she just says things that go viral for, for being so uh, just like the perfect stereotype of a politician who's using a lot of words but not saying anything. It's almost a parody of that. And she does it every time she gives a major speech. Looking at the Republican Party, it looks more and more likely by the day that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee. What about Nikki Haley? How, how much longer can she stay in the race for? She lost the primaries in South Carolina, in, in Michigan. Ooh. What's your take or, or your prediction, I guess, with Nikki Haley? It's really, it's interesting because she, for until actually she just lost in South Carolina, she was getting a lot of money. I mean, she was outspending Trump. She even outspent Ron DeSantis in Iowa, but she outspent Trump and Ron DeSantis in Iowa and New Hampshire, and then massively outspent Trump in South Carolina, especially in the last month. They blew him out of the water because some Democrats and uh, wealthy people uh, that are sort of on both sides of the aisle, uh, give to people on both sides of the aisle, were bankrolling her campaign. They see it as sort of a protest campaign against Donald Trump and not necessarily a viable campaign to actually beat Donald Trump. So the the question is whether those donors are willing to keep putting money into Nikki Haley's race to help her kind of limp along. She says she's going to be in this past Super Tuesday. She already bought a seven-figure ad buy uh, ahead of Super Tuesday. She is putting more money into this race, and she do does still have some money to put into this race until Super Tuesday. But if she wants to really stick it out, she can. It just depends on whether she's able to, to fund that money. And, and personally, it looks like she does have the will to do that. I don't know if she ultimately will, but she has talked about how getting 40% of the vote or getting 30% of the vote, like she did in Michigan last night, she got about 40% in South Carolina, about 40% in New Hampshire. She says that's not a small group of the Republican Party. Uh, and so for her to kind of continue making this stand on what she says is, is a very principled stand, the media really loves it. 
uh, there could be a lot in it for her down the road if she's able to sort of become the high profile foil to Donald Trump, almost the heir apparent after Donald Trump uh, to the that sort of donor class. Uh, so it, it just depends on if people are willing to fund this sort of public relations campaign against Donald Trump. It's more PR campaign than it is political campaign. Okay, finally, Emily, an Italian television show has recently mocked Joe Biden in a Sunday Night Live style skit by poking fun at the president's mental fitness. The skit portrayed an actor mimicking Joe Biden, mumbling through a speech, wandering aimlessly and confusing world leaders' names. Let's take a look. Buonasera, President Biden. Oh, President Biden. President, Mr. President. It's okay. My name is Joe Kennedy. No, Biden. Lei è Biden. <laughs> Biden. Oh no. <laughs> Emily, did they get it right? Is it um a little bit too close to home? You know, again, yeah, I think it resonates with a lot of voters uh, because it keeps showing up in the polls that people think, and it, it happens to Trump too. I mean, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, and, and Nikki Haley has talked about this on the campaign trail. There's widespread dissatisfaction with the same candidates as 2020 being what's on the ballot in 2024. There's a lot of polling that suggests people think Joe Biden is too old to be president. There's even polling of Democrats that suggests they wish they had another option. And so much of it, because he's passed a lot of legislation. He has uh, put a lot of executive actions into uh, order, but a lot of it just comes down to his inability to get through some, some sentences often when he's speaking publicly. He does fall and stumble a lot. And it just reminds me of the, the George W. Bush era. It reminds me of the Trump era when constantly Americans felt like they were being embarrassed on the world stage by their president. Uh, and a lot of the people that were upset about George W. Bush doing that and, and really liked Obama for, for being sort of refreshing and the anti-George W. Bush, someone Americans could feel proud of when he was you know, at the G20 summit, um, a lot of them are defending Joe Biden now. Uh, and I don't think that's really working for, for voters because uh, for voters, you know, when you're not that partisan, you, can, you just see a, a, a man who is, who's really, really struggling, not unlike Mitch McConnell has really struggled with his health. It's, it's very visible and it's, it's almost uncomfortable to watch. And I think the Italian sketch actually really nailed that dynamic. Oh, I think they did too. It is uncomfortable to watch. We keep watching it though. Emily Dushinsky, culture editor at The Federalist. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.